we're in this fruit series, and I got to say, this has been pretty amazing stuff. It seems like we've been in it for quite a while, which I guess we have. We've been in it a few months, but folks, there's a lot of fruit. There's a lot of fruit to, uh, to bear. And uh, th that Galatians 5, 22 and 23 was no small thing. And uh, we're kind of making our way through it. And uh, so he, uh, Pastor Steph had asked me to share in part of this. And so I just wanted to go back through the scripture again, just to kind of do a quick review. And then we'll go on from there. Galatians 5, 22 says... But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now, if you're reading the part before it, I call it the, the, the bad part, that's everything that we're not supposed to be producing. Then it gets to the part of what we're supposed to produce, and if you compare and contrast, a lot of these things that are fruits are really just the polar opposite of what your fleshly nature will produce. And uh, so that's what we're trying not to do. Now, I, I want to do something kind of basic here and foundational and just kind of, uh, I guess you could call it a preface. You ever read a book and they have, a, they have some type of preface at the beginning and kind of sets the stage for what you're going to read? And lots of times it's just a few pages long and talks about it. I'm going to do a little bit of a, a preface today. Um, and I just want to say this, Okay so that everybody understands this before I even go into what we're gonna talk about for a fruit today. No, we're all capable of producing and we're expected to produce all the fruits of the Spirit. Okay, let that sink in for a minute. We're capable of producing and we're expected to produce all the fruits of the Spirit. Okay, does everybody understand that? Now, there may be some that you're, may, you're perhaps predisposed towards because God creates us all differently, and I understand that part, but you can't excuse yourself out of producing some particular kind of, of fruit because of a personality or a circumstance or something else that has happened in your life, okay? I just want to lay that as the groundwork for today, and uh, I just thought that was important because so many times it's just easy to focus on whatever is the easiest fruit for you to produce. Well, guess what? You got to remember who's living on the inside of us. And if we remember who's living on the inside of us and we uh, see what Jesus did in the Bible, we should realize that we're capable of producing all of those fruits just like he did. Okay? So are we all in agreement on that? It sounds like I'm turning it into a, a teaching lesson here, and, and maybe it is for a minute, but I just wanted, want you all, all to understand that. Uh, I really appreciated what uh, Pastor Bunk was sharing last week. He did a great job, and uh, I was so busy taking notes on what he was sharing, but at the same time, notes were popping into my head for what I had to share this week, so I, I couldn't get it all done. I had to go back and watch it again. I liked one of the things he shared right at the beginning. He said, I like to use uh, fruit as a filter for something I'm going to do in my life. It's like, okay, if I go and do A, is that really producing fruit in my life? If it's not, maybe I need to rethink that. And I thought, man, that is really, really good. You know, that our goal of producing fruit should be a filter in our life to make us think about what we're doing with our life. You know, if you're truly being fruitful, and I'm trying to remember how Pastor Steph said this back at the beginning, it's almost like the fruit, is it, did you say violently plucked? It said violently plucked from you. Okay, so if you're producing fruit, you think about it, you try to pull fruit off of a tree. We used to have a, a, a dwarf Meyer lemon tree in our yard, and we unfortunately lost it during the freeze. But lots of times those fruits would, that's a lemon that can get pretty big, almost like the size of a softball. But there were lots of times that you would still really have to yank on it to pluck it off of the tree. Well, if you're producing fruit, people are going to be violently plucking that off of you, okay? But that's okay, because you know what? That just gives you the, the capacity to produce more fruit, amen? Like I was saying, you know, we're, we're capable of producing and should produce all the fruits of the Spirit in our life. And so today, we're going to do a fruit check again. What's our fruit check for today? Gentleness. Now, when Pastor Steph first asked me to do this, it's like, why in the world did she give me gentleness? And I can understand her not giving me joy or something like that, too. I get that part. But it's like, hang on a second. She gave me gentleness. Now, some of you that don't know me, 
Uh, you may not think that's a big deal, but if you've known me for any period of time, say more than a few weeks, or if you've known me for years, and especially if you work for me, oh, you can raise your hand. Um, you're thinking, so gentleness? That's what you're going to talk about today? Let me put it this way. I remember Pastor Bunk was talking last week about uh, one of his sons. I noticed he didn't say which one described him as being a little bit intense. So when he was talking about kindness last week, he thought that was kind of funny. Uh, I'm kind of in the same vein. I'm an extremely uh, task-oriented person, uh, and I like to get things done. And if we can get them done without wasting time, it's even better. Okay, that's just the way that I think. That's just the way that I work. And so sometimes I feel like I have to help others along and accomplish that mission, if you want to put it, if I want to put it that way. So sometimes you're thinking, oh, man, I don't know about the gentleness in there. Well, as I begin to study this even more, and I want to go, I'm going to go back and forth to what Bunk was talking about, because it's two things that are similar, but they're not exactly the same. Um, he was talking about kindness, and he talked about acts of kindness. He was sharing those little video clips and everything. And when you think of kindness, obviously you think of doing an act for somebody. How many of you have gone through the drive through and paid for somebody's meal behind you before? I've done that a few times. That's an act of kindness. Uh, but lots of times when we're talking about gentleness, we're talking about a, a disposition or an attitude that you might have. Let me just give you a, a basic definition here. Uh, I had several different ones, so I had to kind of combine them. Gentleness could be defined as considerateness. Yes, that is actually a word. I did not make that up. I didn't know it was a word, but they had it. Tenderness, demonstrating a posture of warmth, generosity, and caring. A quality of being kind, tender, or mild manner. So once again, I have a feeling there's eyes staring at me right now in this congregation is saying, man, Rod is talking about gentleness. This is crazy. But hey, it was the one I was given, so that's, that's where we're going to go with it. Uh, like I said earlier, you producing fruit is not determined by your personality. I just told you a little bit about my personality or, you know, like Pastor Bunk was sharing last week. Okay, our, our producing fruit is not contingent on that. It's the vein through which we produce the fruit, but our fruit is not necessarily dictated by that. Does everybody understand? Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit more about uh, kind of the difference between kindness and gentleness. Like I said before, kindness is more of an act uh, that a person may do, um, whereas gentleness is more of a disposition or an attitude. And uh, I was thinking about, and Pastor Steph had given me this comparison, you know, if, if you're ministering to somebody that's experienced loss in their life, they've lost a family member or something, lots of times we do acts of kindness. We're providing meals for them and uh, taking care of things in the family if they need help with any type of arrangements. Whereas lots of times the gentleness is just, it's as simple as being there for that person you coming into that situation and being available to minister to them in any way that they need it. How many of you have tried to minister to somebody in a time of loss? It's sometimes it's so hard to even come up with words. You don't, you don't know what to say. You don't ne know necessarily what you're going through, but you're just there for them because you want to be able to minister to them. And lots of times that's what gentleness takes on. If you have a uh, particular disposition or attitude, lots of times those people can sense that you're somebody that's there that they can open up to, that's there for even just to pray about certain things. It's a difficult situation for you to be in trying to minister to them. Because if you've experienced that yourself or if you've been in that for somebody else, it, it, it's different in every situation and it's sometimes difficult to handle. But gentleness allows you to be there to be, to be able to minister to them in whatever way that they need. Um, Another thing I think about with gentleness is uh, it's lots of times, and this goes down to even little kids, they can sense when somebody has a posture of gentleness. They can tell when that person, you know, and we ought to have times when we're in and out of maybe the gentleness mode. If you're a parent, you definitely know what that's like. Uh, but kids can sense if you have an attitude of gentleness. And so another way to look at that is uh, how approachable are you? You know, are you somebody that's able to be approached? If you're not approachable, then whatever you have to give them, they're not going to accept it. You know what I'm saying? If they can't, uh, they, they, they can't approach you with something, then how are you going to be able to share what you feel like you have on the inside? 
Another way to think of it is this. How many of you can think of somebody, whether it's at a party, a family gathering, a meeting at work, whatever it may be, that the attitude changes when they walk in the room? Now take that any direction you want. That when you see a particular person walk in, it's either like, everything's going to be okay now. Or all of a sudden that other person walks in the room and it's just like the tension goes up a notch. You know what I'm talking about? Well, what kind of attitude or what happens to the room when you step into the room? You know, we're responsible for what we reflect of Jesus everywhere that we go. We don't have a day off from that. Whether it's at your job, if it's at church, if it's in your own home, if it's in somebody else's home, the, the, the tone that you set in a room, you're responsible for that. Now think about that. So when you walk into the room, you may have had a hectic day, things may have been crazy, but just stop for a second and think, okay, so what am I conveying when I walk in this room? Does it bring a sense of relief to everybody? Does it cause more tension? Is it going to cause strife eventually? What, what, what is my attitude? What is my disposition doing? If you're walking in gentleness, that is powerful enough that it can change the room. Now think about this. Lots of times when you think of a gentle person, you think of somebody that doesn't necessarily talk a lot. But even that attitude coming into the room without a lot of words can change how that room is. And that's, that's very, very important. Because if you've been called into a situation and you're truly producing the fruits of the Spirit, then you should be able to cause something good to happen in that situation. Amen? You should be going in there with fruit that people can violently pluck off of you. And it should be, I hope, that they see that fruit. Because different fruit is needed for different situations. There's sometimes you come in the room and it's love and joy. That, that's what everybody needs. They see the love. They see the joy. That's great. But what about the times that they need peace or they need gentleness or they need meekness? Are you conveying that when you walk in that room? Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Man, there are so many times, I know personally for me, there's so many times that if I would have gone into a situation differently, it's like, what were the first words out of my mouth? Was it something that caused tempers to flare or did it cause it to, uh, to deflect anger? Another one says, turns away wrath. No, we need to be mindful of those things. Are we truly walking in gentleness to convey that? You know, there's a saying we've had around here for a long time. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. They want to see that you care before they want to listen to the words coming out of your mouth, Right. Because if you have an attitude of not caring, after that, it's just they kind of go deaf to what you're saying. It doesn't make any difference to them. So if you show that you're caring in the first place, it opens that door for you to be able to share after that. Amen? Uh, I want to share something from 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. It's going to start in verse number 23. It says, But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing they generate strife. You could take that one scripture and make a whole sermon out of that. How many of you people do you know that it's almost like it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's their mission in life, but it just seems to be what they do a lot. They, they get into foolish and ignorant disputes. You know, you can get on social media for two minutes and not do anything. Just watch others and you can see this going on. It, it's just, it's become so toxic in our world today because people can just sit there and do it from behind a keyboard. And it, it's destructive. I mean, if you really think about it, if you're getting in a dispute with somebody else online, what are the chances that you're going to convince them of your point of view? It's very, very slim. So are you just doing something that stirs everything up and makes it worse? Or are you bringing peace and gentleness to the situation? It says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. So it goes back to verse 23. Able to teach and patient. In humility, connecting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant, grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. You know, our job as a Christ follower is also 
to hopefully cause others to become Christ followers. And verse 23 and 24 builds perfectly into verse 25 because it says, if we do those things, then it says, I like how it said it, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so they may know the truth. If we do our part, that opens the the door for God to be able to get in there and to do that. Amen? But we have to be walking in gentleness to allow that to happen. I can't say that enough. You know, it's so, so many times it's just that attitude. And if you go back to verse 24, where it talked about, I, I was thinking of a school teacher when I thought about this one. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach and patient. You ever watch the teacher, you have a, a student that's rowdy or maybe doesn't want to learn and you see them in that classroom and how they just have a, a calming effect and they go in there and just through gentleness, they're not in there trying to, you know, uh, push the kid and, and make it hard, make it a harsh uh tone in the room they just go in there with gentleness they're able to calm the kid down and they're able to learn uh that that's a challenge i just i'm just amazed at school teachers and how they do that my sister was an elementary school teacher for years and uh just to be able to talk about she talked about the stories where you'd have kids that were like that and one of their uh, their biggest challenges was being able to to cause the situation to calm down to where that kid was even open to learn you know, that she said that was as, as important as the material that she knew to teach them. If they couldn't get the first part done, the second part didn't matter. And so it was a matter of being able to uh, be gentle and cause them to be teachable. You know, I was thinking the other day in the Old Testament, I was thinking, well, how, how was gentleness used in the Old Testament? And you think of people that were gentle then, and obviously when we talk about perhaps Moses, we talk about meekness because it says he was the meekest man on the face of the earth. But I thought a lot about David because you, you, David's life experiences were over such a broad spectrum. It's like he, he encountered so much. He was the apple of God's eye and he, he fell and God uh, restored him. And it's like, how, what did he think about gentleness? And so I want to uh, share with you out of Psalms. It's going to be uh, chapter 18. And this is him speaking, saying, you have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. This is him talking about God. And I got to thinking about that at first. And it's like, well, yeah, it it, it made him great and that he was a great ruler. But it also was because that allowed him to be a great conqueror and do what God had called him to do. Now, there were situations in there, and obviously, if you read all of David's stories, he went through a lot of heartbreak, but God's gentleness in those situations what was allowed him to be restored, to become the leader that God had called him to be. you got to remember who king was before that. Saul was king, and he had failed, and God had called David to be the next king. God had called David to be the next king. It wasn't David saying, I'm going to be king. As a matter of fact, he didn't. He, he guessed that he wouldn't be king. All of his brothers got passed up, and he was the one that was selected. But he said that God's gentleness not only allowed him to be a great conqueror, but it helped him to become a great ruler. And so we see all these people in the Bible, you know, that lots of times they, they had fallen, they had failed, and the, the gentleness of God is what restored them. It wasn't uh, a God that we would think of that's going to try to strike them down. It was the gentleness of God that cut through that situation and allowed them to be ministered to. You know, obviously, if we think about gentleness in the New Testament, it's easy to think of Jesus. There's so many stories in there where you think about how he ministered to people. And uh, he, he was there were so many times that he did something that was not considered normal. You got to remember when Jesus came on earth, we were still under the old covenant. It was still the old way of doing things and it was still the old way of thinking for everybody. And so when Jesus came in and started doing things a little bit different, a lot of people didn't like that. They either were confused by it or they were fearful of it. And so it caused a lot of conflict. And I want to read first of all uh, from Mark chapter 10 and talk about one of the ways that Jesus was gentle. Mark chapter 10 and verse number 13. It says, The people brought children to Jesus, hoping he might touch them. The disciples shooed them off, but Jesus was irate and let them know it. Don't push these children away. 
don't ever get between them and me. I like how he's irate and gentle at the same time. I guess what the other word we could use is uh, what we used to say was uh, righteous indignation. You know, he was, he was lashing out at the disciples for holding the kids back, but he was being gentle towards the children. These children are at the very center of life in the kingdom. I like how it says that. These children are at the very center of life in the kingdom. Mark this. Unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you'll never get in. Then gathering the children up in his arms, he laid his hands of blessing on them. Jesus was trying to teach the disciples about gentleness. They were so much about, we've got to protect the master, and we've got to do this, and we've got to do that. And he said, no, you're missing the whole point of this. The kingdom of God is about these children. It's about who they are. And he said, you've got to be gentle with them. You know, if you think about what this church does, our whole church is just focused around young people. We've got a Christian school. We have a daycare. We've got a camp. And so I've definitely spent a lot of time around kids. In about a week here, I'm going to be spending a whole lot of time around a whole lot of kids for about eight weeks straight. Victor camp starting a week from tomorrow. Man, it's hard to believe. But we, we see so many times these kids come in, and we don't know what situation they're coming out of. We have no idea what their home life is like. This For them, I'll, I'll be very blunt with you and very honest, a lot of times these kids are sent to camp because the parents are looking for a week off from their kids. I hate to say it like that, but that is true in some cases. It's, it's for them to get a break, but it's like, hey, this is awesome because we get to sow some seeds, and uh, we're going to make the most of it. But you see them come in, and a lot of times you see, you see a kid come in that maybe doesn't get along with the other ones. They don't know how to act. They've never been in a church environment before. And so we have to do everything we can to be able to be gentle and minister to them. I know our counselors, they do a great job, and it is a tough job at times. I've watched them go in there, and you'll see a kid that comes in the door, and you're thinking, oh, man, what do we have happening here? And you'll see that, that child that by the end of the week is crying, and they don't want to go home. They want to spend one more day at the camp. And they keep hugging their counselor. And it's finally like their, their parents have got to pick them up and take them home, but they don't want to let go. And what happened is they've experienced a full week of the fruits of the Spirit changing their life. Man, they were violently plucking that fruit off of there, and they didn't even know it. But that fruit was causing change in their life. That's why it's so important that we need to have that. And like I said, we need to have every fruit. You don't just have one. You need to have all of them. And to be able to minister to those kids and cause that to happen in there, man, what a privilege, what an honor to be able to do that, to say, I had fruit that you were able to use to cause change in your life. Man, that, that is an awesome thing. I don't know if you realize that. That is a huge responsibility, but that's also a huge honor at the same time. Amen? You know, in John uh, chapter 4, and this is a story that we all know about the woman at the well, and I'll start in verse number 3. It says, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he intended to go through Samaria. Okay, let me stop here for a minute. Quick history lesson. Okay, I'm not going to spend too long on it. Usually when I get in history, I get long-winded. I'll keep this short. All right, for those of you who know the Old Testament, uh, Israel was split into two different kingdoms. Uh, when that happened, you had ten tribes that were in the northern part, two in the southern part, and... Um, it was a big mess. They tried to restore the kingdom. It didn't work. And as the Assyrians came in and uh, conquered the northern kingdom, when they came in, they also brought all their idols with them. So the Israelites in the northern kingdom started to follow them. They also started to intermarry with the Assyrians. And so the, uh, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin did not like that. And so there was animosity between basically one kingdom was based in Jerusalem. The other one was in Samaria. Okay, this went on for hundreds and hundreds of years. It was a bad thing. They didn't like each other, even though they were brothers. Okay, so this had become a, a source of uh, tension and animosity for a long time. So this verse 4 is real, real important because it said he needed to go through Samaria. At that time, the Jews did everything they could to go around Samaria. If they could get somewhere else with going through Samaria, they would do it. So it says, so he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. 
Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away in the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it you, being a Jew, ask a drink for me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So already she's kind of taken back by this. It's like, what in the world are you doing asking me for a drink in uh, our capital? Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Why then do you get that living water? Or excuse me, where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? I imagine she's probably thinking, man, this, this guy's a little arrogant here. He's saying that he's got water that if I drink it, that's all I'll need. Uh, I, I'd be impressed to see that considering he already asked me for a drink. You know, that doesn't make sense. He asked me for a drink, and then he says he has living water. So which one is it? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Then the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst or come here to draw. So Jesus said to her, Call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. I wonder what... I wonder what she was thinking at that point. I mean, I know she's going to say something here in just a minute, but she's like, man, who is this guy? He comes in here, says he's going to give me this water, and after asking me for a drink, I'm already confused from that. Now he's saying that, yep, you've had five husbands, and the one you currently have is not your husband. Who in the world is this guy? So she finally says in the next one, which I guess this is all you could say, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Well, Duh, yeah, what else are you going to say at that point? Okay, this guy read my mail. He's never seen me before in my life. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where you, where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming where, when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. He's already starting to tear down those walls. This is where the gentleness is coming in. And he's wanting to break down these barriers that have been here for hundreds of years. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Then the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ, and when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So if we put it in modern English, it's like, hey, I'm the guy. The one you've been waiting for, it's me right here talking to you. So I'm sure the confusion is definitely not settled yet. So if you go on in the next verse, it says, and at this point, point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman yet no one said what do you seek and why are you talking with her because the disciples are still thinking of the Jews and uh, Samaritans being separate but uh, I like how you know they were probably thinking that in their mind but nobody stepped up not even Peter with his big mouth stepped up and said something to Jesus they all sat back there and watched it's like let's just see what's going on here the woman then left her water pot went her way into the city and said to the men Come see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. You know, the whole thing that opened that door was Jesus being gentle in this situation. Just think of the disciples. What if Jesus had sent the disciples to go get the water? What do you think would have happened? Man, that, that would have been some serious tension at that well because they, in the first place, they probably wouldn't have even asked us. Like, I'm not going to ask a Samaritan. I'm a Jew. We're better than them. I'm not going to ask her for water. 
it probably wouldn't have worked. But Jesus knew the whole history. He knew the whole situation. And he walked into it with gentleness. Now, there was some rough stuff in there. Obviously, he told her a lot of things that she probably didn't appreciate. But because of what he said all the way through, that gentleness opened the door for her life to be changed forever. How do you know her life was changed? Because it said she just left her water pot there. She left it and ran. And she went and told everybody in the village, come see this man. Is he possibly the Messiah? Something as simple as gentleness broke down those barriers. It wasn't some big word or some powerful thing. It was just gentleness, that fruit of the spirit gentleness that was able to tear down those walls. Now, don't misunderstand gentleness. It absolutely is powerful. But lots of times we think that it's just because it's some quiet, still thing that it can't do anything. Oh, that's, it's, that's definitely wrong. It's quite the opposite. Gentleness has so much power behind it to get into a situation where nothing else would ever work. Does everybody understand that? It opens the door for us. There's so many times where we need to be listening to the Holy Spirit when we walk into a situation and say, what can I do to help in that situation? What can I do to open the door, Holy Spirit, for you to minister to them? We're just the vessel trying to open the door for him to get in there. Now, I want to go back to what I said at the beginning. I truly believe that every single one of you is capable of doing that. I told you the limitation of my personality. And like I said, sometimes your personality predisposes you to other fruits more than one. But don't ever allow a personality, a circumstance, a previous life trauma, or anything like that to prevent you from sharing that fruit with other people. Or even, let's go back a step, from even allowing that fruit to grow in your life in the first place. Some people say, no, I, I know that that's never a fruit that I'm going to produce. Man, how many times has the devil deceived people with that? Where they go into a situation, and if they would have had plenty of a particular kind of fruit, they really could have ministered to somebody. You know, I talked earlier about uh, lots of times gentleness when you're uh, ministering to a family that's grieving. I, I, I've been through this twice in the last probably three or four months where that situation has come up, and it's just come up quickly. And I realized that, thank God, I had the Holy Spirit on the inside of me and I knew that I had that fruit to be able to minister there because me of myself would have never been possible for me to do that. You know what I'm saying? If you're not a person that's uh, maybe outwardly expressive or emotional where people can see that, then sometimes that's, that's hard for them to approach you. But if you have that fruit of the Spirit, that is conveyed to them. Like I said, even kids can see an attitude that you have, what kind of disposition that you have. And so if that's something that you struggle with, I pray that when you spend your time with God, you would ask him to show you how can I produce more fruit in that area. If you think you're somebody that struggles with gentleness, ask God to help you. Say, I need more of the fruit of gentleness in my life. And you know what? You're going to be able to produce that. And it's not going to take away from you producing any of the other fruit. Man, if Jesus was able to show all that fruit here while he was on earth and he said that when he left, we were going to do greater things than him, then, man, we have the absolute capability to show those fruits in our life. Amen? You know, all these fruits we talked about, and I know we've, uh, we've gone through a lot of them so far, we're just, we're just so capable, and I think sometimes we underestimate ourselves because we forget who's living on the inside of us. And I don't want us to do that today. I want us to realize that he's always there on the inside of us, he's always there with us, and he's always making us capable to do that if we're willing to allow him to do that. Amen. Thank you for watching with us. We hope you enjoyed the message today. We always want to give you an opportunity to be a part of what God is doing here. So if you'd like to give, please text LS Church to 833-245-4492 or head over to our website at lschurch.tv. Again, thanks so much for watching with us and we hope you have a great week.